A quiet dirt road in the countryside. A crow sitting on a gate. A woman on the ground next to her bike, surrounded by a pool of blood. The murder of Bella Wright would kick off one of the UK's greatest murder mysteries. Who killed Bella? And how does a green bicycle figure into this case? Hi, everyone. Thanks for stopping by our table of disappointment. This is How They Got Away, the show where we discuss the unsatisfying endings to your favorite unsolved or unpunished true crime and corporate greed stories. I'm your host today, Kelsey, with my co-host, Annalise, who is intrigued. I thought you might be. And our one guest? It's me, Anna, and a green bicycle. Now, I'm also intrigued. I'm also intrigued. Go on. This one is interesting. We are going to get into this case here. It's uh, This is the murder of Bella Wright. It is more commonly known as the Green Bicycle case. And we're going to get into why that might be. So first, let's talk about Bella Wright. She was born Annie Bella Wright on July 14th, 1897 in Summerby, Leicestershire. I'm doing my best. It's one of those words like Worcestershire where you're like, how yeah. the fuck do you yeah. say this? That's such a cute name, though. Isn't it? And she's like, Annie's cute, but I'm Bella. Everyone refers to her as Bella. Ah, so cute. Aww. She's the oldest of seven children and was born to a agricultural farm laborer. So like a farmhand kind of guy in a thatched roof cottage. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of children when you're a farmer a lot of times. (laughs) Yep, yep. She uh, went to school until the age of 12, which, as I understand for the time, was actually pretty long for women. And then began work as a domestic servant about 13. And then a few years after that, she changed. She quit her job as a domestic servant and became a rubber hand at a factory about five miles from her home. Interesting. I mean, becoming Mm -hmm. a servant for the time, pretty normal when you end school and you're not richy rich (laughs) so Mm -hmm. i feel like there's like there's a point here where like a more modern lifestyle enters bella's life because i think the generation before this she would have begun work as a domestic servant and she probably would have done that until she got married but industrialization Mm -hmm. is happening right at this time so i feel like there is a shift in the uk but specifically in bella's life where she goes and becomes She's in the working force. Like, she was in the working force as domestic servant. But I feel like there's a difference between domestic servitude and industrial workers, you know? Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Labor laws at this time? Imagine how she was working. Horrendous. The conditions? God. That, that's not important. That's not important. It is important, but not for this story. So the factory is about five miles from her home. So she has to travel to and from there every day. And to do this, she used her bicycle. And I think there is an important... Great. Yes, yes, exactly. And there is an important note. The modern bicycle was coming into fashion around this time. So we're not talking like the giant wheel and tiny wheel bike. We're talking like a bike bike. Mm. And there is something to be said also for like the movement of feminism in this time and the role that of all things a bicycle plays in that because before this like you had to rely on a man to get anywhere a horse and carriage if it was anywhere very far or you had to walk and now there's bicycling but also can we talk about how bikes led the way for women wearing pants literally that slay let's go bikes did an incredible amount like you don't think about it but bikes did an incredible amount of things for women at the time exactly bella is a modern girly she is working at a factory nearby she takes her bike she is doing the damn thing and not even really bella's not you know i don't know if she would describe herself as a feminist i think she was just an ordinary woman living her life doing what she had to do she's doing the damn thing she used a bike because that's what made sense she could not wait around for somebody else to take her to work every day and walking five miles back and forth is ridiculous you're gonna bike it just makes sense she was a woman of the times so she was so she had her bike and she was known to use this to travel back and forth from work and 
also just like run errands around her hometown as well as well as the towns surrounding it. She was a familiar sight for people in the area, biking around, doing her own little errands. She was kind of known to do little deliveries for people if she was going places. Truly a young woman feeling her independence. It's like when you get your your first car and or your license and you're like, oh, I can. You know, your mom's like, oh, I have to go do this thing. You're like, I can do that. Because it's literally, uh, if any of you have ever seen Agretzico and she gets her license and it's like, vehicular freedom. It's literally that. You would, you'll use any opportunity to bring up Agretzico. I will. But also I feel <laughs> that line so hard. Vehicular freedom for real. Me when I finally get my Ooh. license. Yay. Anyways. Yay. So in the summer of 1919, Bella was described as a good girl. Uh, sorry. Bella was described as a girl of good looks and character. She was 21 and engaged to a Royal Navy stoker, Archie Ward. He was ah! not in the time. I know. This is hey, after yo. World War One, but people were still in the army and he was on a training vessel at this time. So he was not in town. And she was, you know, she would write letters to him like every other night or so oh my God, to send cute. them off. So cute. She's 21. She's in love. She's thinking about her wedding day. She's working. She's biking everywhere. She's living the dream. She's just a beautiful part of her life right now. It's a beautiful part. Uh She'd also apparently had at least one other suitor at some point and had told her mother about an officer that had fallen in love with her. She's Because she's living. a hot ticket. Aw. She's a hot girly. I literally wrote in my notes, girly living her best life. Hooray. Oh, but then. But Anyways. Then. On the evening of July 5th, 1919, Bella took her bike to go visit her uncle George Mezers at his cottage in Galby. She arrived at the cottage, accompanied by a man who she told her uncle she didn't know all that well. Oh. According to her uncle. Uh-huh. Hello? According to her uncle, though, she didn't seem uncomfortable with this man. She didn't indicate that she'd never met him, but was like, oh, I don't know him that well. But what wasn't worried, didn't seem threatened. She told her uncle, though, that she like would. Like an acquaintance. Maybe. And that's a point of contention in this story. The uncle did not know this man. She did tell she left with this man, but did tell her uncle she would try to give him the slip before leaving him at about 8.50 p.m. And I believe she okay. said this in like a jokey way. Like okay. she made okay. some joke about him maybe being boring because she didn't know him that well or something. I was going to say, I am concerned for you, girly. If you're telling your uncle you're trying to give this man the slip, why don't you just like send him off and stay with your uncle? Yeah. Uh. Uncle made a, some indication of like, hey, do you know this guy? Are you OK? And she was like, oh, yeah, you know, we met each other earlier. You know, he the uncle was concerned. I don't think anyone was super. This was a time where it's a small town. You're not like, I mean, yeah, about people. True, true. I will also say she left with him about 8.50 p.m. That It's the middle of summer in the U.K. It is probably still light out. That was something really weird when I went over to the U.K. I was like, it's fucking 10 at night and the sun is still out. They are on a different level. What? Because, yeah, they have sunlight in the summer oh. much later than we do. They're a little higher up on the on the, la the longitude scale than we are, which I feel is an important detail. Like, it's not pitch black when she's leaving with this guy. That's... Sorry, my head is, like, reeling around the fact that at, t at 10 p.m., the sun is still out. Yeah. But it's important to, like, she's not riding off into the pitch dark with this man. There's still light. They are, both on they are both on their bikes, and they ride towards where Bella lives. 30 minutes after Wright rode away from her uncle's cottage, the body of a young woman was found next to a bicycle on Gartree Road by a farmer named Joseph Cowell. 30 that minutes later. Fast. That's fast. Wow. Mm -hmm. That will also be an important detail for later. Relatives would later identify this woman as Bella Wright because Joseph didn't know her. He just found a woman in a pool of blood on a road. The, her face was severely damaged, bloodied with deep gouge marks in her cheeks and jaw. 
Oh my god. Mhm. Mm That's someone who's like angry at her. That's possibly, really but she was found next to her bike. So they thought initially that she'd simply suffered a biking accident, that she'd fallen off of her bike, crashed, hit her head on the ground and then bled out. That was the initial assumption. So they didn't think this was a murder. So when the doctor arrived, they inst he instructed that the body be moved to a nearby unoccupied house via Joseph Cowell's small horse-drawn carriage. The doctor who arrived, and there's a little bit of time between someone having to go and fetch a doctor and then bring him back, and then they did all of this, but it's still the same evening. Dr. Williams agreed that it was likely a biking accident. And that Wright had died from an injury to the head and then the ensuing blood loss. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's a lone woman with a bike. I, I get yeah. it. Yeah. If you crash, things can happen. Like, you can get really messed up if yeah. you crash real bad. Also, this is before the time of helmets. No one had helmets. It was lawless. Also, like, I remember my brother one time smashing his face into a garage and that looked nasty. So, like... And if you... It really, it just takes... You hit your head at the wrong angle and you're done so, especially if no one saw it. So you could see it. But Police Constable Hall didn't really agree with this. Something was not sitting right with this, with him about this. And he thought maybe foul play was involved. I don't know what exactly about this made him think that. If it was the position of her body, the injuries didn't really look like a crash. But he didn't think it was right. So the next day, he returned to the scene where Bella was found and found a .455 caliber bullet 17 feet from where Wright's body was discovered. Slightly damaged from what they would determine to be a horseshoe, like a horse had stepped on the bullet and then flattened it a little bit. Okay, okay. And then, so then he's like, okay, I've got a bullet. So they went back to where Wright's body was being held, and he examined her again, not the doctor, the police constable, he examined her more closely and found a single entry point wound beneath her left eye. I will remind you that there was a lot of damage before? to her face. Okay, right, right, there right. There was a lot of damage. Mm. What? But that's a bullet wound. Like, come it on. It is. Yeah. Dr. Williams got dragged a little bit for this because they brought him back with another doctor. Clearly doesn't trust do him at this point. I would trust that guy again. Ooh. Here's the thing. This man is a doctor, not a pathologist, and further down the line, it becomes clear he has very little experience with gunshot wounds or ballistics, but okay, also, yeah, sure. come on, man. Man. So uh, he and another doctor, and also, it's important to note that he did not do an autopsy that night. They thought it was a biking accident. They didn't see cause to, so he really only did a... Uh, general examination the bare minimum mm. dr williams and another doctor performed a full post-mortem and confirmed that wright had indeed been shot once beneath the left eye from about six or seven feet away that kind of reads to me as face to face maybe she knew her assailant didn't That's seem to be running away close. yeah yeah no other signs of struggle it's possible she was on her bike and was shot and then did crash, which could explain why they thought it was just a simple bike crash to begin with and would explain the other injuries to her face. I did not see any information about if there were injuries to other parts of her body, but if they were covered with clothes, you know, maybe like some little banged up and bruises, but then the face is uncovered so it receives the most damage. Also at the scene, police constable Hall did find some smears of blood at the top of a field gate that was very close to where the body was found, but did not find any human footprints. And there was also like a dead crow near the gate. Unclear if the, if the blood was related at all. Could have just been a crow having a real bad time. Mm -hmm. The poor crow. Oh, my God. All this to say, unsure if that's related, but this was also near the scene of her body. Okay, and she didn't, like, crash into the pole or anything. It was too far away. No. Hmm. It does not look like it. Several witnesses claim to have seen Wright because, again, she was a common sight around these hurt and neighboring towns biking around. 
They saw her biking with a man before her murder. The description of that man was 35 to 40 years old, 5'7 to 5'9, broad, f- full face with a gray suit and cap, collar and tie, black boots. Uh, this man was asked to come forward, but did not. So no one came forward. Who I don't believe anyone came forward, let alone someone matching this description. Yeah. That's a that's a pretty good It's thing a little generic. To yeah. Too. We would like this it's guy, very, it's everybody. It's very generic as well. Also, like, if you're not the guy, why would you, like, you know, no one's stepping forward. Like, yeah. if you are the guy, and if you're not the guy, no. Yeah. Two school-age girls also claimed to have been accosted by a man matching this description on the same day as the murder. Interesting of, end of note. The most important note that witnesses would make about this man, beyond his physical description, was that he was riding a distinct green bicycle. The green bike comes in The play. green bicycle. Oh my god. So police had their work cut out for them. Kind of a generic guy, but not many people had a green bicycle, I guess, around this town. So they started asking local repair shops if they knew of a bike matching this description. And on July 10th, about five days later, Harry Cox, cycle repairman, claimed to have repaired a bike matching the description just the day before the murder. The plot thickens. The the plot thickens. Uh, He said that the owner of the bike claimed to be taking for, quote, a ride in the country. So he had seen this bike. He'd repaired it just the day before the murder. And then said that the owner said he was going to be taking it for a ride in the country. The country, perhaps, where Bella's body was found. Interesting. And this isn't, like, pointing to that he may have known her. Like, we're talking about how she may have known him in some way, shape, or form, or may have met him that day. But if he's going... I'm so curious whether or not this was a purposeful targeted thing, or if he just came across her during that day. You and everyone else. You and everyone else. I would say nothing we know yet says that we will get more into the evidence about why they think maybe he this person did know her when we get to the say, trial this is really specific of him like it's very specific bike ready and having a gun so it's it would be so odd if this was random but if he's also accosting other girls in the area then maybe he had a different plan for that day anyway i'll let you continue yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say that bikes were a very common mode of transportation at this time. So if your bike is broken, that's kind of like a general problem. So him fixing the bike the day before. Not that Could be related, could be not. Not that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fact that he was going to go biking around that area is the thing that is getting me. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm going in the countryside. Don't mind me. That's goofy. So nothing would really come of it for another few months There's not really any way, there's not really much in the terms of pathology or forensic anthropology. You really don't have a whole lot to go on here. On February 24th, 1920, a man named Enoch Whitehouse was guiding a horse-drawn barge through, full of coal, through the River Soar, which is a canal right around this area. It cuts through several of these towns. Can we talk about, real quick, that last name? Whitehouse? Whitehouse? Yeah. <laughs> that is such oh. a I've never heard someone have the last name White House, and I think that's a little funny. Anyway, continue. This is a this is a barge that's floating on the river and is being drawn by horses, and he has a lead rope to kind of guide the horses where they need to go. As he's pulling on this rope, it gets caught on something in the river. He tugs at it a little to dislodge it, and up comes the frame of a bicycle. He drenched a green up the bike. bicycle. He drenched yes, up he the bike. But it was only the frame. Someone had taken this bike apart and then put it in the river. Police Probably then dragged the canal. Hmm. Police dragged the canal and were able to uncover several other pieces of, of the bike. In fact, most of it. And as well as a holster for a gun. But no gun and no bullets. Upon examining the bike, they found two interesting things, pieces of information. This bike had, for the time, 
a slightly rare coastal break. So most bikes would just kind of break if you backpedal. This one had more of a coasting. I'm not quite sure the difference there, but it was a unique and identifying aspect of this bike. Most bikes would not have this coastal break. A fancy bike. He had a fancy Bro. bike. It, and also, they noticed that most of the serial numbers had been filed off, as well as the BSA brand lane scratched off with probably a fork. Because this was the bike involved. This man was the man. Why would you do that otherwise? Why are you taking apart your entire bike and throwing it into the river if you didn't do something shady? Also, the gun holster. Bro. Yeah, that's completely like non suspicious reasons, Annalise. And there's no evidence that the holster was dumped by the same person. Come on. Girl, I'm not. Crazy. I'm not. I'm not. No. Man. No. Only saying having it. <sighs> yeah. Man. So clearly an attempt to disguise ownership of the bike. However, they missed one of the serial numbers on the inside of the front fork of the bike. So it didn't even get them all. They were able to run this serial number. I feel like... Nobody thinks about how your bike has a serial number nowadays that can attach to you, uh, but they do. And But also, can we talk about the amount of effort at that time period it takes to run any kind of serial number or thing like that. Like, you have to, like, you can't just call up this place or search on the internet or do whatever. Like, you have to go through many steps to research. You have to go number. to the factory. You have to go to the headquarters of this company. Like, it's a wild amount of effort to think about nowadays where you could do that pretty easily and i just want to say that but also can we talk about like the nowadays everybody knows that a serial number is identifying but the right. forethought of that at this time is interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this serial number would lead investigators to one ronald light ronald I will say uh, Bella's last name is Wright and Ronald's last name is Light. And there are times where I refer to them by their last names. Let me know if it gets confusing at any point. I want to make sure oh, I boy. pronounce those distinctly. Also, I've never heard of someone with the last name Light. I've heard of people with the last name Light. I have never heard of someone with the last name Light. Yeah, I was like... Also, get educated, mm -hmm. Alex. <laughs> also, what do you mean educated? If someone's shitty, is their last name, that's like ironic. Yeah, That's true. It's right W R I G H T, but yeah. No, I've heard right. I'm talking about light with an light. Like you're talking about for the guy. oh, I see, I see. Mm? No, I've heard right. I've heard plenty of right. I've never heard light with an L. Mm? Ronald Light was born October nineteenth, eighteen eighty five, to a wealthy civil engineer. Of course, he's got a fancy spike. In 1902, when he was about 16, he was expelled from Oakham School for allegedly lifting a young girl's skirt over her head. I do not know how old this young girl was supposed to have been. Also, no, no charges were officially filed for this. Wild. I, creep. I hate him already. Yuck. Oh, you're going to hate him so much more in a few minutes. Oh, boy. He eventually graduated from the University of Birmingham as a civil engineer, like his daddy, and in November 1906, began working as a draftsman at Derby Works of the Midland I'm Railway. Nepo baby. I don't think he is a Nepo baby. I think he did, like, get the education on his own merit. No, you can get the education, but get a position when your I don't father know. is a wealthy man, and that's it. Because there's plenty of Nepo babies that got education for the thing i don't i don't know i can't answer that in okay i just hate this guy i want many reasons to hate this man there's yeah was, there are so many reasons to hate this guy you don't need to look don't you worry in hey. 1910 he bought a green bsa folding bicycle from orton bros in derby it was a distinct green color with a uncommon coaster brake just like the one from He's the canal a rich boy <laughs> In August of 1914, he was fired from the Midland Railway Company because he was believed to be responsible for a fire that was lit in a cupboard, as well as indecent drawings on the lavatory walls. It is important to note, there is no evidence that he did this. There was a fire and there were indecent drawings on the lavatory walls. There is no 
recorded evidence that he did this, but I do think it speaks volumes that the company was like, it's this you, man. and fired yeah. him. <laughs> All this shit happened because of you, buddy. Get out of our house. Uh, in February 1915, so World War II is in full swing at this point, Light was commissioned as a second lieutenant and was deployed to the Western Front. So he was de he was uh, deployed as an officer. It's important to note that people who were educated were more likely to just be kind of given an officership at this point. Right. Right. Because also having someone educated like that is also something of privilege. Yes, exactly. And not many people have that kind of credential. But also, you do want your officers to be a yes. little educated. Like there you could see both sides yeah. of that. It's it's privilege, yes, but it's yes, also yes. yeah. Right. As with many things in the system even today. Even today. He was deployed to the Western Front in France. <laughs> to quote, uh there's this book, The Trial of Ronald Light, which is just kind of an overview of the trial of this case, which you would think would be very dry, but the author is so dramatic in so many ways. I'm linking it in the show notes. It is such a trip. Uh, this is a quote from that book. Quote, he was slow. He lacked initiative. He would not profit by the experience of his fellow subalterns. He could not organize working parties. He had, in short, none of the characteristics of his class and education. I believe Whoa. this is a paraphrase of a brigadier general who worked with him at the time, means... but I don't want to attribute this quote to them. I think this was a paraphrasing, but that is David. <laughs> I'm telling you, privileged Nepo baby. He, is a, he does give Nepo baby yeah, vibes. Yeah, I was I like, okay, that. that's Nepo baby vibes. Really out here. Huh. This man has no initiative. Boom. Uh, I don't remember what else was said. Scathing reviews. Boom. He is such Idiot. a little Boom. entitled Stupid. baby. He Boom. was sent home and relinquished his commission as officer after only a few months and then re-enlisted as a gunner. I believe this was like, I don't know if he got in trouble before this and somebody was like, hey, you need to re like relinquish your commission as an officer, otherwise you're going to get in trouble. Or if he was like, I don't want to be here anymore i'm not really sure what happened there uh but he re-enlisted and then on september 21st of 1916 his father would die in an accident though many people would claim that this was suicide over worry of oh his son God. being sent to the western front that's just like a weird oh note God. about it i know uh, it's important yeah. to know suicide was very very stigmatized at the time so it's possible that this was suicide and it was listed officially as an accident i don't know the exact details of this mm. i don't i don't know what this was about like was the dad just like a very had like a somewhat delicate sensibility or was already struggling or realized what he had wrought and was like i hate my fucking kid i don't know what's i don't huh. my i'm not gonna slept. claim to know what this was about but i feel like it's an important note to kind of understand light at this point he was, because then, a less than a year later, he was court-martialed for oh forging move orders. What? No. What are you what? doing? So, so move orders are when um, somebody higher up orders different, like, units or yeah. fronts to move. That's, it's yeah. what it sounds like. And okay. he, tr he sent orders to move the regiment, I believe, away from the fighting and then he's a coward. almost via telegram he's... and then almost immediately those were caught and like then were like said no 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 like belay that belay that order and then eventually the and but then also he would send orders that like contradicted actual move orders so that they wouldn't have to get moved closer to the fighting and then eventually the superior who was sending these orders was like hey why why is no one moving and he got caught like so fast, like so fast. This is that's so weird of him. Why would like re-enlist if you're gonna do this kind of shit? I think he was probably planning to do something else, like get oh, a cushy sort of deal. Because they're oh, like, yeah. oh, he probably they know what he did. The but... prestige and honor of having served without actually doing anything. <laughs> I will yeah. say, I don't think it was a choice to be in the army at this time. 
So well, re -enlist reenlisted. Yeah, I'm saying he reenlisted. I'm not saying it was like a. It might have been more like a, I'm reenlisting so that I can kind of have a more of a choice of where I'm going and what I'm doing versus getting drafted because this was the, this Got was a time it. where able-bodied men were getting sent to war. I was getting the vibes well, from yeah. him that he's like, oh, I. But I think he still had a lot of the energy mm. of an officer or was like trying to carry that gate, but was very much not an officer. It's yeah. giving very entitled. Yeah. I will also okay. say that yeah. in this court martial, this court martial was about forging move orders, but it was also brought up that Light had a habit of wearing medals that he hadn't earned. Oh my where god. Where did he steal them? I don't know. I where don't know where he got these medals. He's Dude. like, Can you forge this for me? Can you put this on for me? And everyone's like, Oh, sick metal, where'd you get that from? It's like, shoot. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. It's it features like a singing flea or something um shoot oh it's a monster in paris where like the commissioner has like a box of medals and he's like oh you guys can like pick whatever you want like they don't mean anything it's just yeah. like wild he for this was sentenced to a year's detention in a military prison but would serve less than a third of this sentence before being sent back to the front line in france this was less like a good behavior sort of thing and more of like we're coming to the end of the war. There's a final push happening. We're trying to get the Germans out of France. We need everybody. So I think uh, mm -hmm. circumstances led him to not really be punished for that more than his own merit or good behavior. In August of 1918, he was sent back to England for psychiatric treatment for severe shell shock and partial deafness. Oh. It's not that I doubt that these were true, but I also wonder if somebody was like maybe a little deaf and took the chance. Also, though, if I had a chance to get out of World War One out of the trenches, yes. I'd fucking take it. Yes. I'm a yeah. coward. Like, I am not afraid to admit that I am 100% a coward. And do I understand that some people did some things to get out of it? Yes. Did this man have to fuck up for everyone else at the same time when he was doing that? No. <laughs> no. During this time, when he was back in England, and most peop most men were still fighting the war, he was invited to a man's house for tea and allegedly attempted to seduce his 15-year-old daughter. Gross. It's important to note he was in his early to mid-30s at this time. Gross. <laughs> Yuck. So somebody should be in psychiatric treatment for something, but it's probably not for shell shock. He then bounced around several army hospitals in England before returning to live with his mother in Highfield Street in Lancashire. And here's the thing, like, World War II fucking sucked. Do I believe that he was struggling with that mentally? Yeah. And also understandings of shell shock and mental illness in general were not good so being in an army hospital is probably not as helpful as people would have hoped for those kind of situations and then moving back in with his mom i get it uh he was officially demobilized in january of 1919 i think there are a few months where they're like maybe if you just stay in a hospital for a few months and then you can come back but they were like, nah, you're, you're demobilized. He claimed to have been sent home, quote, a broken man. Mm-hmm. Mm. Possible. Yeah, I think, well, here's the thing. I think anyone who's been in war is not the same. No. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. He so I also on think he lines. was, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yes, I have to, yes, there's some truth to some of this stuff. But also, do I think he was a messed up guy before as well? Yeah. Yeah, before, during, and after, he was a messed up dude. Mm -hmm. Between Bella's murder and his identification as the owner of the green bicycle, so around October of 1919, a few months after, police had spoken with Light about a different case, an alleged sexual misconduct with an eight-year-old girl who lived across the street from his oh. home. Oh my god, he's such a predator. Ugh. Yeah, he is. I don't know what misconduct means. It's a little I don't know. vague. I don't want to know. He admitted to it. 
and apologized and no charges were brought. Are you kidding me? So I don't think this was... I don't think it was rape. But also this was 1919 and I don't know what people's definitions of sexual abuse were. Which is fair. Um, If it's misconduct, he probably just like, I don't know, touched her in places where he shouldn't and maybe did (laughs) not go farther. But I'm also like, I don't want to think about that right now. That's yucky. Yeah. Not I agree. I think this was what this likely was was uh sexual molesting, but yeah. again, we don't know. Still super gross. <sighs> so March fourth, nineteen twenty, they've identified Ronald Light as the owner of the green bicycle, and he had not ever come forward as the person matching the description or the owner of the green bicycle. So he was arrested for the murder of Wright at Dean Close School, where he had been teaching mathematics for the last two months. This was also a few towns over. So clearly, somebody had tried to get out of Dodge. What age were the people he was teaching? What school was this? I was uh, this was a boys' school. And it was, like, middle school Okay. Okay. Still, still don't trust him. I... That's true. Uh, listen. For real. I don't think he should be anywhere near children, period. Yeah. I don't trust him for a second. He Yuck. denied being in or around Golby or meeting Wright on the night of July 5th. Denied even owning a green bicycle. Bro. I literally don't have a green bicycle. What are you talking about, everybody? That's you, bestie. Literally, police were like, oh, yeah? Then what about this paper that says that you bought this exact bicycle with this serial lover then he said then he backtracked and was like okay i did have a green bicycle at some point but then he claimed he'd sold it years before couldn't remember to who i'm surprised he didn't say it was stolen sips drink (laughs) well as we remember he's not the smartest person like remember him on the front line clearly not oh let's go forward let's go back let's go we're gonna stand still everybody What? Upon his arrest, police searched his room and found a, quote, parcel containing ladies' underwear, plus some indecent prints and literature. Dude! I couldn't find information about whether or not these these undergarments were, like, actually owned by a woman. And it's also unclear if this was, like, freely given underwear. Because that's, like, a thing people do. I know, okay. but it's so gross. Considering how he has been after children, I don't think yeah. any woman would be interested with him because he's probably like, I'm not getting any game or attention from these women, so he's therefore right. I shall prey on younger ones because they don't know better. I don't... <clears throat> Grown men are still like that to this day, of course, but... Ugh. <sighs> when it comes to indecent prints and literature, it's also important to remember this is right after the Victorian era. So there's a little bit of difference in what one would consider indecent. I did find a couple of sources that said this indecent literature was like an advert for contraceptives. Okay. <laughs> what? Hey, buddy, what do you have that? It's, just, it's important to know that like sexual liberation, not a thing. And also right. like... A boy can own a Playboy magazine that doesn't make you a killer, but this is like the Victorian era. But his other things that he has done. Yeah. It's important to note, but is clearly not the headliner when it comes to the sketchy behavior of Ronald Light. Mm -hmm. A detail in the context of this nasty, nasty man. Here's the thing, though. Yuck. Nasty man. What is the actual evidence, though? Let's go over it. Several witnesses, eyewitnesses, identified Light as the man they'd seen with Wright that night. But eyewitnesses can be unreliable. Also, also though, these eyewitnesses included both Harry Cox, who'd fixed the bicycle and would be familiar with both the bike and the man, as well as George Measures, who actually spoke with this man briefly. Okay. So it's not like some of these people like would have caught a glimpse. Other people actually were speaking with him, would have had more time to actually take the time to know what this man looked like. Right, right. So there's a mixed bag there. A little more reliable. 
It's also important to note that police practices would be updated a few years later in 1924 after several cases of gross miscarriages of justice because mm-hmm. the methods by which police obtained um, witness identifications or other evidence was considered no longer considered fair to the accused. So it's important to note that we're just a few years from changing our methods because they're not ethical at this point. And this was kind of known at this point. Police would know at the time that these eyewitness statements are a little shaky. Yeah. But also, his mother's maid, Mary Elizabeth Webb, told police that on the night of the murder, Light didn't come home until 10 p.m. after the murder would have taken place. He was supposed to be home early for dinner, like around 7.30. So he was late. She also noted that the clothes he had worn that night had either been sold or destroyed. Bro. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That's weird. It's weird. He was seen and later would admit to being in Bella's company 35 minutes before death, if we are to believe George Mez's identification of him. 35 minutes. It is not illegal to be in the presence of a murder victim 35 minutes before their death. Yeah. That's a pretty tight five. window, though. That is, mm-hmm. especially considering how quickly all this happened. Mm-hmm. Yes. Through a paper trail, they were able to establish that he definitely owned the bicy- the green bicycle in 1919, but again, he claimed to have sold it before the murder, and no one could pinpoint exactly when that would have occurred. Although the maid again said that he rode home on this bicycle, or at least a similar green one, and that it was in the kitchen the night of the murder after he returned home. And nothing tied him to its disposal in the river, which is the most suspicious aspect of this green bicycle, uh, other than its distinct color. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we have a holster. We have a bullet. We have no gun. They never found a gun Uh, for this. The murder weapon, missing. Missing. The bullet was consistent with those used for Army service revolvers. Who has been in the Uh, Army recently? hmm. But hundreds of people had just returned from war, many with Army service revolvers. That's generalizing, but not distinct in terms of evidence. There is also no evidence that tied light to the bullet. Even having had an Army service revolver at the time of the murder, or even having any training in using the firearm that was used in the murder. So we don't know right. if he even he had a gun at all or if he had one, right. if it was the type used in the murder or if he even knew how to use that kind of gun. It's important to note, though, in the Army, you would receive training in several different types of firearms. Huh. His last own personal recollection of owning a firearm was in 1915. He claims to have relinquished it upon submitting himself for treatment at the psychiatric facility and that he never got was issued Mm -hmm. another one and in theory all officers would have been given one but there was a shortage not everyone actually ended up getting one and also he left the army as an officer and then returned as a gunner so it's possible he would have been asked to relinquish the weapon at that point Mm -hmm. they did try to reach out to the war office to see if they could track down the paper trail of who was assigned one weapons. But it was a lot. The war had just ended. There was a lot of back and forth. They really couldn't figure out if he had ever been given this type of revolver, right. whether, let alone if he still had had it. And that's pretty key to this, too. Yeah, that's yep. weird that they wouldn't have it. I feel like because you mentioned there's a shortage, wouldn't you want to keep track of that shit? Well, no, there was a shortage of the particular kind of revolver they believed ah. to have been responsible. So some mm-hmm. officers would have received that type of revolver while others would have received a different one. Okay. And it wasn't clear if he'd been the one to receive one of these or not. One official at the war office, during trying to track down this paper trail of multiple departments in different areas, also mm-hmm. pointed out that had a r- army service revolver been used as the murder weapon at that range, would have been very large and very obvious of a wound versus the very small, hard-to-see entry point. 
also on Be- that we actually saw on Bella. So mm-hmm. there's a question there. Mm-hmm. It's important to note that forensic ballistics was a thing and had been a thing since 1835. But it was somewhat rudimentary. It was more a case of being able to look at the striations of a bullet and match it to the striations on the inside of a barrel of a gun. So being Mm -hmm. able to match a bullet to a weapon, a little bit harder, especially when this bullet, like we said at the beginning, had been damaged, likely by the horse hoof. Right. Mm. That that puts that to put the that makes it a little bit of an issue, (laughs) a little harder to work with. Yeah. So at this point, we're not even sure what kind of weapon did this, let alone if Light had access to it. And people maybe saw him with Bella the day the day of the murder. People are pretty sure they saw him with Bella the day of the murder. But again, that's not that doesn't mean he killed her. And it's also important to say the doctor who eventually made the report that Bella had been shot, Dr. Williams, was not very familiar with ballistics and had missed the injury entirely on his first examination. Right. There was also, his report indicated that she'd been shot from point-blank range Mm face-to-face. Others would also put forward a ricochet theory to try to explain the smaller wound, smaller injury, to say that the uh, revolver had been shot and ricocheted off of something else and then hit Bella to try to explain the smaller entry point wound. But there's like... It doesn't hold a lot of water, in my opinion. But again, like there's no there's no forensic anthropology at this time to try to recreate the wounds to her face. There's kind of rudimentary forensic ballistics. It's really just kind of what people say. Knowledge right now. Yeah. And I think it was great when they just got the bike determined and traced that. I'm very. I know the bike was like no, yeah, real police work there. (laughs) <laughs> They'd be like, serial number, go! And I'm like, but again, I think that, like All this is so, like, very loose threads of, like, possibly if he had this and did this, and yeah, he's not a good dude. We have established no. that. But does not being no. a good dude automatically make you a killer? No. No. So all told, the only real evidence that pointed to light was that he was in Bella's company, Maybe. Most probably. And that he'd owned this bike, which, granted, pretty damning. Also, he did not come forward when police asked for a man matching that description who'd been with Bella the day of the murder who had a green bike to come forward. He never came forward. If he was innocent, why'd he lie? He also lied to police that he'd been with Bella, that he owned a green bike at all. That's kind of wild to do if you're innocent. Yeah, yeah, but we also established that he's not really... He's not smart. No, yeah. and he's not he's the not... bravest guy. Like, you don't have to be brave. That's fine. No. But also, he's not the bravest guy. So the idea of him, even if he didn't do this, possibly getting in trouble because he steps forward, like... For the prosecution, yeah. the recently appointed Attorney General, Sir Gordon Hewitt Casey himself, prosecuted this case, which is pretty rare. With for murder cases in general, except for the uh, except for poisonings, which at the time were considered particularly egregious, I I guess because it's like interesting, interesting. I don't really know. I think it's because like you have to like. There's so many more steps. Like pre- poisoning is so premeditated. I guess I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I could get that. Mm. Premeditation is like a big thing. Yeah, it indicates the level of public outcry there was at the time for this crime that he felt the need as attorney general to make this public appearance, make this public stand. Also on the prosecution team was Henry Maddox Casey, who was a leader in the criminal courts. So we got some big names as well as Damn. rising star Normac Burkett, who I mentioned because he was later a judge at the Nuremberg trials. Oh, my God. Just okay. This was his first murder case. This was baby's oh my God. first murder. Baby's first murder case. Hooray! Baby's first murder case. Oh boy, no, that's. So I just funny, think that's though. really just a f- interesting note. All the big guns are coming because they're fine. I think they're like, are we gonna get this guy in jail or what? Well, here's the thing. 
despite knowing that a lot of their evidence was kind of shaky with eyewitness testimony, they mm-hmm. did believe that conviction was assured. There was a lot of public outcry mm-hmm. around this case. They wanted someone to go away for it. And they had these powerhouses on the prosecution. Right. You got a dream team. We got a dream team. But also, there's a reminder here that murder at this time, 100% of the time, carries the death penalty, unless you get, like, specifically pardoned. So there's this sort of shadow over the trial for jurors for murder there's cases. There's a lot of weight to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's like, it's important to understand that jurors knew that if they ruled guilty, the man would die. And they knew that. And there was this coloring to it. But if we, I don't focus as much on the defense team as much as I do on this one guy. Okay, one guy, hello. (laughs) Sir Edward Marshall Hall, KC, was a very expensive lawyer. Oh my God. Daddy's money. Richie Rich Boy. (laughs) The inheritance after he died. Richie Rich Boy, who was known specifically for saving his clients from the death penalty, was like known for taking on these kinds of cases. I feel like an important for the time note for this case as well is that legal aid for those who could not afford lawyers Mm -hmm. existed at this point. Like the, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. This started to exist. But to be able to take advantage of that, you basically had to lay out your case to prove that you needed aid, that you needed that you could not afford it and that you needed somebody to who understood law to help you with your case, which meant you had to lay out your co- whole case so the prosecution would know what you were planning on using. But if you had a private lawyer, you didn't have to do that. You could keep your defense hidden. You didn't have to share your defense strategy until game day, which can be a major advantage. Interesting. That's and It, it is weird to have to prove... That you like, yeah. There's a lot of people who can't defend themselves because they don't know the system and wouldn't even know how to yeah. lay out the strategy. That's why they don't make you do that anymore. Yay! I would shit Thank myself. God. Granted, I would surely not do such a thing where I would need to be in court, but um, you know. Very expensive lawyer, known for getting people off for the death penalty, and a private lawyer, so you did not have to share your defense until game day. These are huge mm-hmm. advantages. And so the trial began June 9th, 1920, a month short of two years Mm. after Bella's murder. At this time, the burden of proof fell entirely on the prosecution. The defense not obligated to admit to anything. The prosecution had to prove everything from start to finish. Sir Hewitt chose to begin his opening statements as prosecution, not with light, but with Bella. Quote, the jury has to understand from the very outset that murders are about victims. The accused murderer, star of the show, though he sometimes appears to be, has a mere bit part. It is the story of the life loss that matters. This is also from the trial of Ronald Light, (laughs) notable British British trials, book 87. 87 read it it reads like a stage play the author is so dramatic for no reason and i live for it but i think that's a good point because i have a lot in this case about the trial and bella seems to kind of get lost in the shuffle here and that happens a lot with these kinds of cases it happens a lot because people want to hear the why the how but and like we're true grandparents we're talking about the why and the how but you have to remember A person has lost their life, and that is the central point of this. Defense lawyer Hall did his best to make his client appear to be a good, delicate man under tremendous stress. You know, Bella's murder trial is a lot for him, you know? Dude. As a a rich Nepo baby, I... Oh, this is so trifling to me. Dying women? Oh, No, I couldn't bear with the... Shut the fuck up. And he's like, oh, it's so hard to hear about this woman who died two years... Two years ago? About? Yeah. Two years ago. Oh, shut up. 
You're like 30. The prosecution tried to argue that Light and Wright were familiar with each other before the night of the murder. This could indicate whether or not Bella was an intended target or not. They reference her uncle's testimony that the man with Bella had referred to her as Bella and not Miss Wright. And she didn't seem to mind it. At this time, that would have been a big no-no to refer to an unmarried woman as, by her first name if you did right. not know her very well. Like, you would yeah. not do that. That's, yeah, I was going to say, that's an extremely yeah. like familiar thing to do. She claimed to not have known him very well, but did not indicate if she knew. She seemed to indicate that she'd only met him that day, but it's possible she kind of knew of him. But again, unless you were very familiar with each other, you would not refer to a young woman by her first name. That mm -hmm. was just a no-no. There was also the testimony of the two girls who had claimed to be accosted by a man matching Light's description that day. They would later pick out Light in a police lineup. But their testimony wasn't as helpful as you might think. The thing is, they didn't come forward until nearly nine months later with their oh. story. And in court, they also admitted to having heard all about the case before coming forward. And police had asked them if they'd seen light that day. Like, yeah, they're a leading in a leading that. question sort of way, like specifically asked, did mm -hmm. you see this man that way? And that That's kind of ruined their credibility with the jury. And I kind of admit, like, that's not a good look. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Yeah, that's not. It's not good. No, it's not steady ground to stand on. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, Dr. Williams' inexperience with gunshot wounds was only made more clear. Uh, the pro the defense lawyer Hall cross examined him not by calling in an e another expert witness, but by using his own admittedly considerable experience with guns as well as his own per his knowledge from personal friends who were in the gunsmith trade that he consulted informally before this trial, which would not be cool today. That's not, not cool. Also, apparently, Hall was known for a party trick of shooting his own wife's hat off her, her hat? hat. Like at parties? Those are expensive! What, <laughs> what a crazy... That's so random. What are you doing? <laughs> they like brought it up as to reference like he was a very experienced gunsman. And like, I, okay, but what a random so thing weird. to do, my guy. It seems like Hall was really well known for being a really dramatic lawyer. But also was just <laughs> like that. He's built different. Like he was the stereotypical theatric lawyer. I might just be a simple country boy, but also watch me shoot my. You wife's know what they hot. say about lawyers being actors. Exactly. He truly is like, I am a theater kid, huh. but my dad may think go to law school. <laughs> my dad said that he couldn't support a <laughs> lifestyle like that, so I had to go do something else. <laughs> but he cross-examined uh, Dr. Williams himself, which I don't like you. Cross-examining the expert, fine, but using his own experience, which when it comes to forensics, I don't think would be allowed today. No, because at least not on this level. Yeah. They also called forward uh, one Harry Clark, which is a local gunsmith that was called for the prosecution, who agreed with Hall that he could not say if the bullet had been fired from a revolver or a rifle due to the damage to the bullet. Hmm. And we talked about it. It was like squished. Yeah. So that is kind of hard. And a service revolver is the only firearm even remotely connected to light. Once again, they could not prove if he had ever had one or not. Right. But he definitely never owned a rifle. So if they couldn't even prove the bullet had come from a, re a revolver, the bullet's now a non-starter. Yeah, they couldn't prove this man had a gun. Mm. So <laughs> Exactly. And once again, forensic anthropology would not be invent invented until the 1940s. So forensic ballistics was the only real science they could be relied that upon in this case, other than so basic like pathology and examination. Yeah. Nowadays, everything is so heavily based on anthropology, ballistics, sciences, yeah. forensic sciences. Yeah. But like they didn't, they couldn't rely on it. Yeah. They didn't have it. They didn't have those tools. Uh, much more heavily on police work, like with the green bicycle. 
It was also pointed out that Measures was partially deaf. It is possible he misheard hello as Bella. I guess the middle. I mean, yeah. Right. He denied this possibility. He swears up and down that the man referred to Bella as her, Bella, her first name. But this definitely puts doubt in the minds of the jury. He did admit that he was partially deaf. This was a known fact about him. So, yeah, it puts also doubt. Also, someone who is not deaf mm -hmm. and any, you know, I mishear yeah. things pretty regularly. So, like, even if he wasn't, <laughs> you could definitely... Mm -hmm. Miss here, Bella, for mm -hmm. hello. Light would be called to the witness stand in his own defense, which I think is pretty common today, but was actually a relatively new practice for mm. the time. Interesting. The prosecution, here's the thing. We've talked a lot about how Light is a real sketchy guy, but it cannot be brought up by the prosecution unless the defense says something to try to attribute a good character to Light. They cannot bring it up unless the defense brings up first his moral character because it's technically not relevant. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Interesting. So we know that Light is kind of a garbage guy. But once right. again, that doesn't make you guilty of murder. No. And even if it does, you cannot bring it up unless the defense is like, he's a great guy. And then you can be like, actually... He's not. Uh, false. So, and, but also then, so that means that Light has to take the stand in his own defense and try to convince the jury that he's a good guy without trying to make any claims <laughs> that he is a good guy. Oh my God. That's a thin, really hard line to walk. It is. But Light's class, because he's rich, and his service really? in the army, this is right after world war one so veterans have a higher status just for having fought in the war endeared him to the jury right. enough to at least make it and they whole knew this when he put light on the jury He's a man who served his oh country. they bring that up that's all over the defense let's like not talk about him trying to move away from the front lines and messing with orders we're not going to talk about that he's a man who uh, he served his served. country that's actually a good point because, again, they have to be careful about mentioning his service record because if, if you do, then the prosecution can bring up that he's been court-martialed. So there's a very delicate balance here. And I think it's really fascinating because there's so much that we know about Light that is makes him a bad character. But can did the jury know that? Should the jury know that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Upon taking his own defense, he immediately admits that he had been the one to throw his bicycle and his holster into the canal October 1919. Oh, and also he filed off the serial numbers and he lied to police about it. What a way to go. Dude. Right out the gate. You know what? I mean, kind of props for him for admitting that kind of stuff. Like, I don't think also... he did it out of any sort of self aggrandizing, oh, no, 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 no. self-moralizing no, 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 no. way. No, But that's still pretty ballsy to say. He also admitted that it was him who had been seen bicycling with Bella the evening of the murder. Okay. I will, he also said, though, that he had surrendered his revolver before being sent home with shell shock. So he said, yes, it was me. Yes, I threw my bike and holster in the river. I did not have access to a revolver. I didn't kill her. <sighs> why didn't you come forward then, my guy? Yeah, if you had all this stuff, why didn't you come forward? And it's weird. Okay, I was saying, like, it's pretty ballsy to say it now during your murder, murder trial. Or during the murder trial. But also, like, what's your strategy? Yeah, like, you, you got questioned for that shit earlier. It's actually a pretty <laughs> ingenious strategy. Oh, because he's like, oh, I'm saying all this truth and... Because I'm saying all this truth and I am a serviceman. I, you know, all these great things about myself. I'm going to tell you what actually happened. But you know what? I'll admit to this, but I didn't do yeah. that. I was scared. Yeah. And so I, I scared. took my bike, shaved off the serial number, threw it in the river. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Yeah. He says <laughs> the reason he did not come forward and the reason that he threw his bike in the canal 
And also the reason he filed up the serial numbers is that he thought no one would believe his story and that he waited so long to either to come forward or to discard the bike. Because remember, it was like a few months later that he discarded the bike. It was because he just he couldn't make up his mind on what to do. Shut up! He was this shell shocked veteran who didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. He also denied ever meeting the two girls who claimed to have been harassed on July 5th. Which further, like after all this honesty, further discredits their testimony. Mm -hmm. I cannot really speak to whether or not the girls were telling the truth or not. There's a lot with theirs. Like they waited way, way long. The police kind of led them to pick out light. It's it's I could see that being thrown out of court. There's really not a lot there. It's pretty shaky. Mm hmm. So here's Light's story in his words. He says that he saw Bella on the road while biking that day. She had asked him for a spanner. Apparently there was something wrong with her bike. And then they biked together until they came to Galby, where Bella had said where Bella had said she had a visit to pay that would take about 10 minutes. Light took this as a suggestion that he should wait for her. He did. But when she didn't return, he made to cycle off but found a hole in his tire, and when he repaired it, he decided to go back to see if Bella was still around. He saw her coming out of the cottage and called out to her. He claims he said hello and not Bella, and that this was around 8.15 p.m. If any part of that is a lie, I think the coming and going is to make him seem less like a creep for waiting outside of a house for a woman he barely knew for like over an hour right man right because that's a little wild at this point i would also because i just realized i haven't mentioned it we will recall at the beginning bella had at one point told her mother that an officer had fallen in love with her mm, right Light was at one point an officer. He was an officer. <sighs> Which, again, he's telling the story to make it imp make it known that he did not know Bella the day before. Or not the day before. That he didn't know Bella before the day of the murder. Which could indicate premeditation. But he could be the officer that Bella had mentioned. He could not be. Which would make sense that she's like, yeah, I know him, but like, mm. Or it could have been a total different dude. That's true. Because she was a hot a ticket. Exactly. She is a hot ticket. Good for her. <laughs> wow. But like, and to like, there's this idea they're trying to present to the jury. Like, who is biking around the countryside with a revolver waiting for someone to shoot? Obviously, nowadays, we know that there are creepos that Creep. just do that. But this was the early 20th century. There's definitely more of like, would, like, did you know Bella beforehand? Was this purposeful? Did she reject you? And that's like, this is like some revenge plot. But there's really no evidence that he knew her before July 5th. It's all he said, she said. No one else right. can pinpoint them knowing each other. He then goes on to say they left together in the direction of Leicester corroborated by Bella's uncle. He saw them both leaving on the road towards Lancaster. I am trying. I don't know how to pronounce this town. He said, Light says his tire went flat again and that he, and, and that Bella continued on while he fixed it. He then caught up with her and then they biked up until they came to a crossroads. She told him he, she didn't live at Lancaster and that she had to say goodbye. I'll remind you at this point that she told her uncle she would try to give him the slit. Right. But also, she I don't think she, she didn't live in Lancaster, so also just true. Mm -hmm. He says this was about 8.40 p.m., and then he arrived home about 10 o'clock. The prosecution was shocked by his admissions, and that left them very little to work with. Right. It just can't, he just came out and said everything. Like, there's nothing for them to pick apart there. He just said the facts. Yes. And the defense at this time doesn't have to admit anything. So the fact that they chose to just come forward and admit all these things was a bold strategy. And then the defense rested with reminding the jury that if they found like guilty, 
he would hang. He would hang for this. He was a young, educated man suffering from shell shock after World War I. What will this do to his future? You would take away this man's future? How long? This rich, privileged man's future? How long has it been since, like, mm-hmm. World War I ended for this case? Because if the murder was, like, what, two? About it, two-ish years ago? Sorry, I'm trying to make, like, a visual uh, timeline the, for me. The trial or the murder? Like, uh, from the trial, when did, um... World War One ended in November of 1918. So this would have been maybe a year and a half later. Oh, okay. I was gonna go, like, cope, bitch. But I don't know. <laughs> um, PTSD is serious, but and also fuck like this guy. the UK suffered a lot more yeah, from World so, War One than we right. did. So there is like active people are actively yeah, rebuilding. Yes. But fuck this guy. The defense also pointed out that the burden of proof falls on the prosecution, and that they would not proved Light's guilt beyond reasonable doubt. And I gotta be honest, no, they didn't. They really didn't. Sorry, guys, but you you didn't. The jury <laughs> deliberated for three and a half hours before coming back with, can you guess, not guilty. Yeah, because they're like, he was so honest. Here's the thing. I don't disagree with the way the trial was yeah. presented. I don't disagree. There's not a I don't think that I would have v- voted guilty. Like, there's just no facts. And the facts that there were... Doubt. Yeah, there's reasonable doubt. And the defense, their strategy of being very upfront and honest with the facts really well, worked in their favor mm-hmm. with having Light stand in his own defense, which was new at the time. So that would have like caught the prosecution off guard, would have definitely caught the jurors off guard. And then for Light, like you have to pick and choose for trials for when you should or should not have your defendant testify in their own defense light was an educated eloquent young man he was smart he knew exactly what kind of position he was in he would be able to skirt the line between presenting himself as a well-to-do man without actually saying anything that would leave them open to anything the prosecution could throw at them like his hella sketchy history they weren't able to bring that up at all because they managed to keep it out like light was the perfect defendant for this strategy and Hall knew that he was being smart about it so light was acquitted of the murder and his status daddy's money the privileges that come along with that not only endeared him to the jurors but gave him the opportunities to get off of this if he had not had the defense lawyer he had if he had to present his defense ahead of time if he didn't have the class and the status that comes along with it, maybe this would have gone a different way. Because again, people wanted to see somebody hang for this. So the fact that they they thought this was a slam dunk because the jurors were people from the town who wanted to see somebody in trouble for this. They're itching it. The fact that it wasn't, they were itching for it to be resolved. And the fact that it didn't was a surprise to a lot of people. And I think it's also important to remember that Murder carries a capital punishment, so that factors into jurors making a guilty or not guilty verdict. If capital punishment was not on the table, would they have maybe said guilty? That's a fair point, yeah. Because there's something to be said as a juror that you know that you're sentencing sentencing someone else to their death for this. Like, you want to be sure. Mm -hmm. And, like, this is not to put down Sir Hewitt and his defense is not his defense, his prosecution team. He's considered a experienced and very competent lawyer, but he had no motive. And that is also a huge thing for a case in front of a jury. Mm -hmm. You have to give the jury a narrative. Why did this happen? How did this happen? And he didn't have a motive. There was sort of an unspoken, people kind of understood that this was maybe like sexually motivated, but there was no like sexual assault to Bella and there was no evidence that Light knew her or not. Mm -hmm. We know that he's a huge creep, but that couldn't be brought up in the trial as a history of being a creep to women. Yeah. And it's possible he was the officer she told her mom about and she, she was engaged, so she probably rejected him. 
and then maybe saw him again, thought they were on goodish terms. Maybe he tried to, you know, appeal to her again. She rejected him again, and then he shot her. <sighs> it's hard yeah. to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't think, based on the fact that she was facing her attacker, there were were injuries to her face but it looked like they had been like crash injuries maybe she was biking towards this person or something like that and had been fired upon like it didn't seem like she was expecting this it didn't look like she was running away or had any defensive injuries Mm -hmm. although again forensic anthropology not a thing for another 30 years so it's possible modern interpretations of this discipline would have given us a very different picture. Mm -hmm. Sir Hewitt did argue that the why didn't matter, only that it was done. But that's a little, that's a little flimsy, Mm -hmm. especially when you're sentencing someone to their death. I think he did do a very valiant effort here. Yeah. It's like, mm, you can only do so much with what little you have. Which even then, it's not like solid. Yeah. It's like, oh, you could use this, but then someone could be like, however. And then you could fumble easily. Mm-hmm. So. Fair enough. But what about Bella? She kind of gets lost in the jumble of this tr- widely publicized trial. Her murder remains unsolved to this day. Did Light do it? Was it a, rom- a jilted romance motive? Was it a different motive? Was it someone else? I would say at this point, we're probably never going to know. Mm-hmm. Most of the people who were involved in this are now passed on. People in the UK do s- consider this a very interesting murder mystery. People are still mm-hmm. looking into it. I don't know Why if they would ever... It? Yeah. I don't know if they would ever exhume Wright's body to try and like use modern forensic techniques on her body to see if they could make any more determinations i also don't know what evidence were saved if they still have the bullet somewhere and where did the gun go where'd it go in another river where did it go another river i mean if i were light i'm not gonna dump all of my damning evidence in the same canal maybe there was another canal i don't know two-thirds is like (laughs) maybe he hid it somewhere Mm. because he could have just buried it in the woods somewhere and it probably would never be found which right. is fair. Mm-hmm. So that's that is the green bicycle case. You will notice there is a lot more here about the trial than there is about Bella, and that's because Bella gets lost. Even the case is called the green bicycle case, not the murder of Bella Wright. That is kind of unfortunate. But yeah, that's what I have for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I would say that our table. This uh, Gartree Road is like this little dirt road that's surrounded by fields on all sides. So I would say that our table is in a little field on the other side of that gate. There's a dead crow by the gate. Mm. There's a pool of blood on the road now soaked into the dirt. Something happened here. Unpleasant. Maybe we'll never know what. Damn. Pushing your chairs. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.